I can't stress how excited I am for the Oppenheimer movie. Christopher Nolan is consistently one of the most unique voices in cinema who continues to incorporate scientific concepts in all of his films. From Inception to aspects of the Dark Knight trilogy to Interstellar and Tenant, these films bring ideas that most people don't typically consider. While you can debate whether or not the narratives of these movies are more stable or flow the best, I appreciate them on a fundamental level because they can inspire people. Fun fact, my special and general relativity professor from university actually worked on Interstellar. Now, just some background if you're new to the channel. I'm the Shuckmeister, full-time engineer and part-time YouTuber. I studied engineering physics for my undergraduate degree and nuclear engineering for my graduate degree. I'm one of the few people who's seen in person both B-29 bombers, the Enola Gay and Boxcar, that ended World War II and visited Hiroshima last year. I love learning about this field of science specifically, which is why I spent five years at university studying it, and even wrote my master's thesis on modeling safety features in nuclear reactors. The topic of this movie is very personal to me in many ways, and I'd like to explain that through this video. It's often difficult to find movies that don't throw out the word quantum to justify their fantastical sci-fi concepts. So that's why out of all the Nolan films, Oppenheimer has the potential to be one of, if not his best. It's a new horizon for him as a director, being, to my knowledge, his only biopic. Someone like me, who's studied people like Oppenheimer, for many years in college know where this story is going. And for that reason, I'm even more excited that it's going to be shared with the general audience. Robert J. Oppenheimer was a physics professor at UC Berkeley before he was recruited by General Leslie Groves to spearhead the Manhattan Project, America's $2 billion adjusted for inflation endeavor to acquire a nuclear weapon during World War II before the Germans could. See, by the early 1940s, the splitting of the atom and nuclear science had already been established by Heisenberg in Germany and verified by Oppenheimer's research group. Sustained nuclear reactions were being validated by scientists like Enrico Fermi with the Chicago Pile No. 1 and other famous names attached to the Manhattan Project. Another fun fact, while my grandpa was serving in the U.S. Navy during battle battles like Leyte Gulf in the Pacific, his sister, my great aunt, was working on the Manhattan Project. This massive effort had operations all across the country, mostly in locations where national laboratories currently stand. And there are so many stories that could take hours to cover. So that's why with this video, I wanted to cover some of the craziest stories that are relevant to this movie that you may or may not hear about otherwise. And where's a better place to start than the time that Oppenheimer almost blew up the atmosphere? In the lead up to the Trinity test, they were dealing with the very small possibility that when they pushed that button, they would set fire to the atmosphere of the Earth and destroy the entire planet. And yet, they pushed that button. The self-ignition theory was propagated throughout Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project. This is an exchange between Oppenheimer and Arthur Compton, the leader of the metallurgical laboratory at Los Alamos, and the namesake of Compton Scattering. This quote is from Oppenheimer himself. Hydrogen nuclei, Arthur Compton explained to me, are unstable and they can combine into helium nuclei with a large release of energy, as they do in the sun. To set off such a reaction would require a very high temperature, but might not the enormously high temperature of the atomic bomb be just what was needed to explode hydrogen? And if hydrogen, what about the hydrogen in seawater? Might not the explosion of the atomic bomb set off an explosion of the ocean itself? Nor was this all that Oppenheimer feared. The nitrogen in the the air is also unstable, though in a less degree. Might it not, too, be set off by an atomic explosion in the atmosphere? The Earth would vaporize, I said. Exactly, Compton said, and with that gravity, it would be the ultimate catastrophe. Better to accept the slavery of the Nazis than run the chance of drawing the final curtain on mankind. The thing that Oppenheimer feared was a concept known as fusion, the process in which the sun creates helium in a non-stop reaction that produces an enormous amount of energy that keeps our world lit and going. Oppenheimer considered that this could potentially happen with the nitrogen in the air. These questions were raised in 1942, and countless calculations were done to prove that it was actually an impossibility that the atomic bomb could cause this to happen. The temperatures needed to cause this reaction were orders of magnitude above the 4,000 degrees Celsius that was generated by the bombs created during the Manhattan Project. By 1945, the concerns that the Earth would blow up were relieved. That didn't stop Fermi, the delightfully devilish trickster, from taking bets on if the July 16th, 1945, 
1945 Trinity test would actually end the world. Not sure what he would have done with the money if the Earth blew up, but to each his own. I do expect the movie to build up this concern a lot more since Christopher Nolan has stated that it did inspire this movie, but keep in mind that even if it was a concern, they knew by the Trinity test that it would be alright. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. So that was crazy. But what was even crazier were the two Demon Core incidents. Since Oppenheimer is the father of the nuclear bomb, the vast bulk of the movie is about the Trinity test, the first plutonium bomb that was detonated on a 100-foot tall tower in Los Alamos. By the end of the Manhattan Project, the US had constructed three bombs, one uranium and two plutonium. Now, uranium is the densest naturally occurring element with 92 protons in its stable state, uranium-238, which signifies the number of neutrons it has. However, the processing of uranium can create a radioactive isotope, uranium-235, which is the same element but has a different number of neutrons. Now during the Manhattan Project, uranium was being mined from inside the US, northern Canada, and even the Belgian Congo. However, even after processing, this was only enough to create one bomb. The mechanism for which a uranium bomb works is pretty straightforward. By firing a neutron into its core, a chain reaction of fission can occur where neutrons continue to slam into each other, causing more atoms of the element to break apart and release a massive amount of energy. Now, plutonium is not a naturally occurring element. It had to be processed at places like the B reactor in Richland, Washington. Fun fact again, I almost got a chance to tour the B reactor facility, but the tour was canceled less than 24 hours before because of a COVID outbreak of 200 people in the town of Richland. Very unfortunate indeed. The new challenge with plutonium compared to uranium was that plutonium would fissile out before reaching its target in the bomb upon triggering, essentially making every test a dud. However, if they could set off explosive charges around a solid plutonium core, all at the same time, this would cause the structure to implode, forcing neutrons fast enough into the plutonium-239, creating plutonium-240, which would undergo the same chain reaction spontaneous fission that could make the design work. This concept is how we get the Trinity test, the bombing of Nagasaki, and the Demon Core incidents. It is beyond shocking to me that the Demon Core incident happened after the bombs were dropped and the war ended, because this is just wild. This solid sphere of plutonium had the same design as Fat Man, the plutonium bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki, and was given the moniker Demon for claiming two lives while it was being assembled. In late August of 1945, tungsten carbide blocks were being installed around the core as a ring to reduce the size of the device by preventing neutron flux from escaping, thus reducing the mass needed to reach criticality for the desired chain reaction. These were the first reflectors, and nuclear power plants used the same concept to keep higher sustained power outputs during longer periods of time. Now the problem was that these blocks needed to be installed manually and very carefully and unfortunately, a young Harry Doglian made a mistake by placing the final block on the assembly. The core was at a state of super criticality, and Harry's knee-jerk reaction to that warning caused him to drop the block into the center of the core, making it go prompt critical, which causes the device to start fissioning. He had to manually remove the blocks to stop the reaction, but by the time it was over, he received a dose of 510 rem of radiation poisoning. He died 25 days after the incident. This was the first criticality accident in the history of nuclear science. Nearly a year later, in May of 1946, the same core was being used to demonstrate the first steps of a fission reaction using a beryllium hemisphere. Louis Lawton tried to separate the hemisphere using a screwdriver, which was not experimental protocol, and it slipped, causing the upper hemisphere to fall onto the core, making it go prompt critical so hard that the air turned blue from all of the ionization energy created as Slotin received a fatal dose of 500 rem of radiation. The Demon Core is a great example of the outcomes of nuclear weapons. Recently, I woke up to check Twitter and learned that there are people who genuinely believe that nukes don't exist. Simple arguments like these can easily debunk the irrational Twitter conspiracy theorists who have the mindset that if I didn't see it with my own eyes, it couldn't have existed. 
See, from my inside job video, you can tell I really enjoy the comedy of conspiracy theories like flat earthers, moon landing deniers, and the rest of your commonplace conspiracies. But nukes are kind of important and real, considering we spent an entire half-century Cold War fought over the basis that they do exist. Radiation poisoning and the aftermath of such explosions are very real, and this is what it looked like. So, always stay curious and wise, and don't fall into the stupidity of those kinds of individuals. Atomic test. The Russians have a bomb. We're supposed to be years ahead of them, but... So what were you guys doing in Los Alamos? Now, a good place to wrap up these stories would be the discussion of spies. These individuals are part of the reason that Oppenheimer's career after the war fell into shambles. The Rosenbergs tend to be the most famous names that get thrown around, but there were two others that were just as, if not more heinous, Klaus Fuchs and David Greenglass. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg had funneled top secret information about nuclear weapons, radar, sonar, and jet propulsion to the Soviet Union and were executed by the federal government for doing so. Ethel's brother, David Greenglass, sold secrets on the uranium enrichment process from Oak Ridge, Tennessee see initially, and then Los Alamos, New Mexico from 1944 to 1946. He wasn't executed, but served nine years in prison for his espionage. But Klaus Fuchs was the primary source of the leaked information to the Soviet Union about the Manhattan Project, and all subsequent nuclear weapons testing up until the year 1949. Starting in 1944, he worked under Oppenheimer for a short period of time and was present during the Trinity test. He was also able to get close to Norris Bradbury, the director of the project who replaced Oppenheimer after the war, and Richard Feynman, one of the most influential physicists of our age. And while he was convicted, he only served in prison for nine years in the UK before migrating back to East Germany and becoming a renowned physicist there. The history of Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project is a well-weaved story, and I can't stress enough to say how much I appreciate that it's finally being adapted to the big screen in this way by a director I love. Seeing the effort and craft going into this Christopher Nolan film is just a joy, and I cannot wait to see it. Thank you so much for watching. I really had a personal connection with this subject matter for obvious reasons. If you're excited about the film, please let me know. There are so many great movies coming out this summer from Across the Spider-Verse, Sound of Freedom, Mission Impossible, and Barbie that are all just sucking the money out of my wallet right now. Let me know which films you've seen or are planning to see and what you're most excited about in the Oppenheimer movie. Post those down in the comments below. I might review the movie after I see it, so let me know if you're interested in that too. Have a beautiful duang and I'll see you all next time. It's very Christopher Nolan in that I don't understand it and it gets worse the more questions you ask. How bad is it on a scale from inception to interstellar to ugh, tenet?